Yo, 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 yo! What's up, all you burner stoners and potheads? This is Weed Man 420 with the Weed Man 420 Chronicles. How are all you v -v -v vipers doing out there, Mrs. Weed Man? Mr. Weed Man. How the hell are you? Doing great. How are you? I'm doing awesome. Do you want to know why? Why? Because we are sitting in our 95% done studio hmm. that I destructed and you constructed a masterpiece. And I want to thank you. You're very welcome. For making this awesome studio that I've been thinking about and dreaming about for a while now. And it has, one, my favorite color, green. <laughs> <laughs> it has my canna bar that I just, that was a surprise. How did you come up with the canna bar? That was not fully the plan. I thought I was going to make like a little bourbon and beer bar and then have all of your weed accessories on a neighboring wall. And I set it all up with the accessories on the neighboring wall and then started to set up the bourbon bar. And I was like, this, this is dumb. We need a weed bar. That makes more sense. Yeah. So I just uh, rearranging and brainstorming and a little handiwork and some shopping for pieces of furniture that fit the space. And boom, we have a cannabis bar, which actually was really fun to put together. It's badass. Yeah. It's so badass. Got all my favorite things in there. Also a little bourbon. Also some beer. Also all my seeds are in the fridge and, and my hash and all the good stuff and all my weed and all the accessories. It's badass. It is. It's so dope. I mean, I, I, I look at it every day. I come down here and it makes me smile. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're all about stopping the stigma. You come to, you come to our, our studio, our house, you're going to see weed. We're not hiding it. And it's out in the open. Our tray set is out there. Our smoke set is out there. Our jar sets are out there. All of our goodies are out there. And it looks awesome. So, Mrs. Weed Man, yeah. thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you, thank you. It was a wonderful surprise when I got home on Friday. And I came downstairs to look at this studio. And I was nothing but gleaming. <laughs> <laughs> it took a minute. You had to process. You were yeah. just kind of taking it in. <laughs> and I came down like a half hour later. And you were like... Yeah, <laughs> this, is, this is good. <laughs> we took a basement. I mean, our house was built in 1947, right? We have an old home. Yeah. And we renovated a few years back, well, about like six years ago. But we didn't do the basement just at the time. I don't know. The budget was stretched and it just didn't seem like a priority. But then we regretted having not done it because we had all the, the crew here to do it. We should have just done it. But we anyway, did it ourselves. So we just decided it was time to freshen it up and really... Five or six years ago, we weren't doing the show yet. So had we redone it at that time, it wouldn't have been what we needed it to be right now. So yep. we've basically, it, we took a small space within the basement and um, created more of like a studio environment because we do hope in the near future to start uh, video recording our episodes and putting those on YouTube. So we just wanted the layout to be more fluid. And we have wanted a guest. Yeah, we needed to be more comfortable while we were recording. We were just kind of like squeezing into spaces that weren't really great, but we were trying to find a space that recording quality would be good in. So anyway, now I feel like it is a little bit more professional. Yeah. It's freaking yeah. awesome. I it's can't wait to have fun. some guests down here and mm -hmm. have some friends and family come and smoke out and see our weed bar and everybody just come and roll yourself up a joint or Get yourself a little nip of bourbon and a little beer. I mean, this is awesome. So thank you again. And we'll be showing more pictures once it's fully done. we got a little bit more left to do, but I'm super stoked for you all to see it. So also, I got a swag box today. Yeah. From Get Doinks. And I've been saying Doinks for years. And I was in Michigan last uh, uh, two weeks ago. And so a bud tender was wearing a shirt. And I said, where'd you get that shirt? Can I have one? Can I buy it? He said to me that... He got it from this company, and I, I found the website, and I reached out to them, and they sent us a swag box for you, me, Dav Boy, and T. But, so, like, so that we can also promote their products, yeah, right? Like, as a little partnership. Yeah, I'm going to yeah, wear the it's shirt. pretty sweet. The shirt is awesome. It says Doinks on it, mm -hmm. and, and uh, you got to go check them out. It's getdoinks.com. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the awesome swag box. I'm going to wear that shirt all the time because <laughs> I love it. And that made me even happier. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the for just the swag box. I appreciate it. And Mrs. Weeman appreciates it. Uh, I love the sign. 
It's going to go right I know next... where the sign's going. Oh, yeah. You know, too, oh, right? Yeah. Under the shelf. Oh, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's just got to go there. It, deser- right. it deserves a spot because I've been saying doinks for years. So you get a spot on the canter bar wall, get doinks. <laughs> 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 Thank you again. I'll have to try your flour, your uh, your pre-rolls next time I'm out in Michigan or in Colorado. I'll have to try your stuff. So I know those are the two states you're in. I don't know if you're coming to Illinois soon, but definitely we'll have to try your stuff. Uh, next time I see it. So appreciate appreciate the swag. Um, also, we started watching uh, the new season of, what is it called again? It's called The, um, the Handmaid's the Tale. The Handmaid's Tale. Wow, 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 wow. She's 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 ruthless. She, yeah, she got screw loose. Well, I mean, she's, <laughs> I, yeah. I, we all know why, but man, she is ruthless. So we're on episode two two of the new season and me and mrs Weeman were like holy shit man they he's referring us. to june who is yeah. the main female character of this show and she's kind of whacked yeah, out from got, all the shit that she's been through yeah so she's kind of she's, she's on a just on a roll she wants to seeking kill. revenge yes revenge revenge yeah <laughs> yikes i wouldn't so, want to be on her list <laughs> yeah. and then on saturday mm-hmm. we watched a really good movie the longest oh, beer so run. It was so cute. With Zach Efron, right? Is mm-hmm. that, that his last yeah. name? Efron? Yeah. He was actually really good in that movie. Mm-hmm. I've seen some of his movies. I, I, I wouldn't say I'd, I saw all of his movies, but the ones that I've seen, he's good in. But this one was actually really good. Mm-hmm. Based on a true story. Yeah. Yeah. It's a story of him. He's a um, merchant marine. Merchant marine, and he is not sailing at the time. He's not kind out on a, the boat. Kind of a bum. Just kind of being a 20 something guy it's during the vietnam war all of his friends a lot of guys from the neighborhood are out at war and he just hangs out at the bar quite frequently with his friends who seem to have jobs but they're there after work and he joins up with them bill murray is the bartender there who is also a veteran and kind of schools these boys on what really happened in the wars and why they should have uh allegiance to their country and pride in their country and he says something to the effect of, yeah, I should go bring beers to the to the boys over in Vietnam. And they're like, yeah, you should. You're not doing anything anyway. <laughs> and so that kind of evolved into a reality. He he said it, and everyone basically forced him to do what he said. Like, yes. you're you're always a guy who, who says you're going to do something, and you never do it. You so, flake out on everything. Yeah, so he decides not to flake out on this. And so it's his story of courageously traveling around Vietnam in the middle of the Vietnam War into like hot spots to seek out all the guys from his neighborhood that are living in different areas within Vietnam fighting in the war. And he goes to find each of them to deliver beer. And he does. American beer that someone tells him somewhere along the line, you know they can get that over here. (laughs) (laughs) But it it was really a a well done story it was really a nice yeah you teared at the end yeah it was sweet yeah he brought it to all of his friends and the crazy thing about it at the end they showed a picture of of him and the guys uh, that he visited Uh, critter was his name right no no let's not try to we'll never remember it i thought it was critter critter yeah, I critter? think so. Okay, yeah, I think it's it, critter. It's a sweet movie. <laughs> if you're looking for an easy watch, yes. it was yes. it was it was worth the watch. Are you ready to smoke? I'm ready to smoke. You go ahead and light that joint up. Yeah. So this is a strain from our friend Big Earl, and that we got from him. And this is uh, tropical cookies mixed with some sprinkles. So let's read what the cookies, the tropical cookies, is uh, sativa dominant. Because I'm gonna have to read both of these. Because it's a it's a crossbreed between the two strains, so there's not really a true name for this strain. But the cookies, the tropical cookies, is a sativa dominant strain created through a cross of Girl Scout cookies and tangy strains, searching for an insanely delicious flavor that will have you particularly begging for more. Ms. We meant to go rip. Uh, <laughs> you found it with uh, with these uh, tropical cookies. It was bright bud packed, super delicious, sour citrus high with slightly sweet exhale. So it has a little bit of an earthy pine flavor to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it'll give you a little bit of energy, uh, some mind and body tingly happiness, and a sense of creative uh, motion, motivation, which is great. So basically runs between 21 and 28%. Calming, creative, energy, and focus, giggly, relaxing, and sociable. Uh, the symptoms it relieves is anxiety, depression, mood swings, nausea, stress. And uh, some flavors are citrusy, flowery, fruity, sour, and sweet. Aromas are earthy, floral, orange, sour, spicy, and citrus. Now, that's the first part of the strain. The next part is 
Sprinkles, which is originally called Titty Sprinkles, but they took the titty off. Now it's just called Sprinkles. This one is a 70-30 uh, Indica Sativa is usually when Sprinkles is made. So I basically would just say this is a 50-50 blend, I guess. Uh, the THC range on, on Sprinkles is anywhere between uh, 17 to 24%. And it is an Indica Dominant created through crossing the powerful Grease Monkey and Purple Punch 2.0. Uh, silly name aside, Titty Sprinkles packs a super tasty flavor and even more delicious effects that are perfect for a lazy night at home when you need a little extra help to get to sleep at night. The high settles in a few minutes after you final exhale, filling your brain with a sense of happiness that's heady and lightly weighted. Ooh, heady. A tingy sense of comes next, slipping into your brain before taking on the body and leaving you feeling relaxed from head to toe and pretty out of touch from reality. <laughs> Great. Yeah, but you're Let's mixed. Let's see how this goes. It's a mix. Right, right, So you right. got a little bit of both. You got a little bit of euphoria, energetic, with a little bit of going to sleep. So the effects are body high is uh, body high, happy, relaxing, sleepy, tingly, uplifting, and uh, relief symptoms of anxiety, arthritis, chronic pain, depression, insomnia, and stress. The flavors are berry, blueberry, fruity, grape, spicy, sweet. And the aromas are berry, blueberry, chemical, diesel, earthly, grape, and pungent. There's your gassy you always yeah. talk, we've been talking about. So those are the two strains mixed together that Big Girl crossbred. Uh, Tropical Sprinkles is the name of the strain. So super stoked. What would you think? I'm I gonna think smoke. it's delicious. Yeah. I hope it's not too strong because I smoked a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you took a big rip. Oh, it's still mm -hmm. lit, too. Yeah. It's good. Mm -hmm. I tasted the piney. I tasted some fruity and some diesel. Very nice. It's nice. It's smooth. Big girl, you grow nothing Always but the good. best, my friend. Oh, man, we love this. Everything we've gotten from you and everything you've given us and, and had us try. and Oh, man. I'll probably smoke this on the show we're doing with him next week. So You're not lit. I'm out again. What happened there? <laughs> <laughs> well... You're lit. I'm lit. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> My Mr. Weed Man. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, man. That was a big rip. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we'll see how this show goes. That one actually made me sweat. That hit. Yeah. <laughs> so this ought to be fun. You ready to start the show? I'm ready. I'm ready to start this show. The trap is forever. Why the traditional market isn't hurting your pretendo. This is done by High Times. They've been writing some really good articles. I would also like to thank High Times for putting us in their magazine for what, Mrs. Wee Man? The 2022 Black Friday gift guide. There you go. We are in it. We are in it. Make Eight sure you decades. check it out. So this is a really good article. And I like this article a lot because, it, one, they use the word traditional market. And we, Mr. and Mrs. Wee Man, have been saying that for a while now. I, I was just in a meeting with somebody last week, and I used the word traditional market, and they looked at me. I'm like, uh, the illicit market, the illegal market. Like, I love that name. I've never heard that before. I'm like, yeah, that's how I say it now, traditional market, because that's all we know. So really good article on this one. So the secret of the traditional market. Just come out and say this right now. The traditional market isn't going anywhere. I know people that still buy from their plug. And they've been buying from their plug for years, and they ain't going to a dispensary, and they're not going to buy it. So, And the recreational market isn't harmed by it. In fact, its whole existence, at least since REC, and in the future when full legalization drops, is in spite of it. There's a multitude of reasons why traditional market is here forever, like over-regulation and taxes. Man, I have so much to say in this article, uh, but let's keep on going. But the long and short of it boils down to this. The rec market simply doesn't cater to its consumer the way the traditional market does. Until the quality of the product or concern of the end user matches that of the lifers, we're simply talking about two different ball games, despite the fact that they're playing with the same equipment. Stoking fear. Now, sure, they're going to be a bunch of new jack corporate types would pop up out of either to warn us about the pesticides and the poisons that are seemingly rampant on the traditional market. Uh, <coughs> you better check your own weed out first. Oh, did I say that out loud? I've been smoking weed since the early 2000s, and it's still better than what you get at any dispensary shop 90% of the time. 
despite your best efforts. Now, this is coming from someone who's been used to uh, the exos off a guy we later found was spraying their nugs with Raid. And trust me, they were all sick for uh, a week, he says in this article, after uh, smoking uh, Raid weed. So, once again, still be careful. But they still went, kept on going to their plug. The anti-traditional cannabis mall cops have been trying hard to get the danger fear to stick for years. We had reefer madness. We had vape gate. We even had people believing that stoners are actively and in your town giving out drugs to kids intentionally on Halloween year after year. I say intentionally because I'm absolutely positive it happened accidentally before, but it's not a, some conspiracy. Consumers want to consume, not force it on others. And the sheep eat it up and even believe that this plant is not only a danger to them, but their kids. Since laws started passing in our favorite institutions that uh, by now warn kids everywhere about the dangers of the traditional market. Before, you know something crazy, Miss Wim? Before, they warned you about drugs are bad, McKay. Cannabis will fry your brain, McKay. Now they're warning you about going to the traditional market hmm. and getting your weed. Now they're warning you, don't. it's okay to smoke cannabis, but don't go to your plug, which you've been going to for 20 years. Crazy. And you've been smoking his weed for 20 years, and you're still alive from smoking right, his weed. Right, right. Right? They're trying to drive the train. And encourage that you buy your cannabis in a legal store like a good little capitalist. Well, let me tell you something, folks. Sure, some of the stuff you find in the traditional market is molded or didn't pass testing. <coughs> I've seen it in legal dispensaries also <laughs> but it's also where you find the best of the best i don't know anyone who got this game because people are telling us that it was a great idea we came out of love for the plant so why in all the pro uh, propagandist expertise would i ever want to buy from someone without that type of love for the plant the type of sacrifice i get that not everyone is at my level of obsession, but doesn't it seem to make sense that those who would be in the type of people you'd want to buy from, those who dedicated their life to it, not just jumped on the new money train. My policy, this is the writer's policy, has always been to try and buy cannabis from the guy who looks and thinks he's an actual wizard. <laughs> he's got that good. It's If it's not clear why yet, keep going. Uh, vulture capitalism, or why you're not getting high on your supply. A normal person is probably asking themselves, if the legal players don't care about the game they're playing, why are they in it? Here's his answer. It's simple. It's five letters. It begins with a G and it ends with a D. Mrs. Weedman. Greed. Ah. Over the past few years, we've seen countless articles highlighting the opportunity of the cannabis market. You know the one that used to lock our OGs up? Well, now it's a multi-billion dollar opportunity, and people are celebrating the new industry as if there was in decades of effort that got us to this point. I digress, but the point is now that the Wall Street Journal is touting how many bees there are to be made, all the suits' ears perked up, and they started playing the game they know. Now, here's the big difference between the game we love and the one that they're playing. Playing for margin is almost never about max maximizing value for the end user. So for all those caregivers who cared about providing you the best quality medicine for your ailments, hence Michigan Caregiver Program, because if it wasn't for the Caregiver Program, Michigan wouldn't be where it's at today in their cannabis game. Okay? Let's not forget about that. There's now a gang of mostly washed out corporate types who think you're the new prey for the cheap CPG bullshit. Oh man, I read that line, I was smiling. <laughs> so they've built the size and scale facilities the operators who have been around can't possibly compete with, hoping they would they could wash them out in favor of cheaper, flashier, branded low end. <laughs> Like I always said, my mids are better than their headies. <laughs> <laughs> the catch is, cannabis isn't some easy, repeatable plastic good. It's produce. It's the sixth largest crop right now. So while all the new players are racing to automate and produce a gazillion pounds for less than you'd pay for an ounce on the street, it's surprising no one has looked toward other fruits-based industries for guidance. I know the machine trimming sounds cost effective, but ask yourself, why does Tropicana still have fruit pickers? 
hmm, handle that orange right. with care. It's just different. Right? Right. I personally like and enjoy trimming. Yes, I'm only trimming two plants, but I enjoy that process. It does. It is a lot of work. I just trimmed my two plants. And I and was now there. you have a bad... Achy back, <laughs> back, achy back. <laughs> but I enjoyed doing it and smoke and grinding it up. A couple of the mm-hmm. really heavy wet nugs and smoking it while I was got. I mean, I was baked, but I enjoyed the heck out of it. It was my plants, my medicine that I grew for Mrs. Weedman, myself, and people I love and care for. I love it. I, I probably wouldn't love it if I had a hundred plants to to do. Probably about by like the fifth, I'd be like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, it's a lot of work, but the enjoyment factor of it, because it's yours. The lungs of experience and the rise of expertise. Lifers know that the plan is much more than a set it and forget it type business. That's part of the reason, in, in this writer's opinion, why so few celebrity, celebrity plays have been effective thus far. It takes a lot of effort to produce a world-class product. And while you may be able to do it once, it's even harder to maintain the quality your base has come to expect. Sure, from the outside, it's easy to think we're all flocking to flashy, flashy mylars and influencers. But the kingmaker in this game is and has always been the flower. Automation through cost-effective can remove the human element required to produce truly great cameras. Even worse, the lack of experience from the new jacks are forcing production for bud size and total weight over the cultivar expression true heads look for. Sure, some of the some of it looks great on Instagram, but we're talking about something people have to smoke. They're going to handle it, and if the mids is not that hard to set to tell. Sure, you can probably make a sale once off of good marketing, but retaining a consumer, especially in a market with this many options, is very difficult. Oh, yeah. Brand loyalty, we talked about it on a prior episode. It's getting tougher and tougher because there's so much variety, and if you fuck up once or twice, they're moving on. They're no, I mean, this is way different uh, of an atmosphere because most people, you'll see, they'll find caregivers. They're going to find home growers because they're going to realize they smoked their buddy's home grow and thought it was a lot better than mm-hmm. they got at the dispensary. So they're going to go right to their buddy and be like, hey, yo, I'll, I'll incorporate with you. I'll help you out. Right. Like I talked about, doing a co-op grow at someone's house who's willing to do it because their weed is better. So all that is said, the most important part of any sales process is the consumer, right? Well... These legacy guys actually know theirs well, too, not through a bud tender or through an Instagram page, but through having boots on the ground by being where they live, by living their life. You look at the operator like Doja Pack. The guy is everywhere. With that comes real meaningful interjection with your clients. You can truly learn what they like and what they don't like. You get that from the boardroom. The reason someone like Doja is winning because he calls himself uh, what the market will be like rather than wishing on a prayer. He doesn't even need to grow it. So this is just a guy who's on, he's a street guy. So, which is awesome. And people know him because he's on the streets. Um, and trust me when they don't, the traditional dealers hear that too, directly from the consumer. They have to hear about the colorful language that comes from someone who feels like they were ripped off. The ones who want to keep their base adjust accordingly. Imagine that catering to your consumer. So the cheat code of the future. The one question I've always had for the scale guy is why I, this, this writer totally understands better margins look great to investors. How do you reckon with the fact that the smallest batch stuff always sells for the highest? Never, never mind what price you're hoping to get it for, but if it's clear the markets respond to premium products and exclusivity, how can having a market depleting supply seem like a victory in the eyes of your consumers? Consumers just don't want anything, and they certainly don't want trash. Remember that. We, we're paying for quality product, especially in some states because the taxes are so fucking high. I mean, here in Illinois, you're paying 60, 70 bucks for an eighth sometimes. And you see some sales and shit like that, but it's just like so expensive, you know? Um, a lot of people are going to start looking different ways. So I thought it was a great article uh, by High Times. Wow. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm baked. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Mrs. Weedman. Pot-smoking baby boomers are on the rise. Why are scientists so happy for them? 
tell us, Mrs. Weed Man. We're not boomers. We're, we're our parents are boomers. Our parents are, yeah. So, and I try to get my mom to smoke all the time. <laughs> she does on occasion. Well, she doesn't smoke, she'll but she'll have an edible, edible yeah. here and there. Yeah. Well, as cannabis users get older, and as weed consumption among seniors becomes more common, a group of scientists honed in on this large demographic of pot smoking baby boomers, and guess what? The results suggest that the use of whole plant cannabis does not have a negative impact on cognition. In fact, the opposite is true. The study, done at the University of Colorado Boulder, examined the effects of cannabis use in adults aged 60 to 88 with no history of alcohol or other substance use disorders. Gary Wenk, Ph.D., a scientist not involved in the study, not involved in the study, noted that while high THC levels can have negative effects on the adolescent brain, quite the opposite is true with older brains. Older cannabis users, relative to non-users, have significantly greater neural communication between their cerebellum and the hippocampus. Why? Age-related changes in the endocannabinoid system include a decrease in the number of cannabinoid receptors throughout the brain. The endocannabinoid system, a significant aspect of our human physiology that helps maintain homeostasis, is a complex cell signaling system in the brain and body that interacts with just about all of our body systems. Um... During normal aging, the decline in cannabinoid receptors correlates with increased levels of inflammation in these brain regions, causing a loss of neurons in the hippocampus, which is critical for learning and memory. This, in short, explains age-related memory impairment. Wenk referred to his own laboratory studies that showed improved memory, decreased brain inflammation, and increased hippocampal neurogenesis in older brains after the daily stimulation of cannabinoid receptors. The potential benefits are important given that the cerebellum and hippocampus are highly vulnerable to the effects of aging. The hippocampus is stable until around age 50, at which point it undergoes a rapid period of atrophy, he wrote in Psychology Today. Adding that hippocampus atrophy is consistent with mild cognitive impairment. The few human studies of the effects of cannabis on the brain in middle-aged or older adults found little or no negative effects on cognitive function. Longitudinal Longitudinal studies that compared pre- and post-exposure performance reported that cannabis was associated with improved cognitive task performance in middle-aged adults, Dr. Wang wrote. Low-dose daily cannabis use after the age of 55 might effectively reduce the degenerative effects of chronic brain inflammation, Wang concluded. Whoa, that's big. Low-dose daily cannabis use after 55 might effectively reduce degenerative effects of chronic brain inflammation. Hell yeah. Smoke weed. Smoke weed. Every day. It's like your vitamin. You just have to have your... angels in those leaves. Mm -hmm. That's all I got to say. I agree. Smoke your weed every day. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, you know, back like a couple years ago, everyone was all panic-stricken about... Uh, the vape crisis, and remember we were doing Popcorn a bunch of loans, yeah, we were all doing that. all those articles and right. stuff. We were reading a bunch of, we did a lot of investigation, and we had uh, some people on to talk about it too. Well, weed vape card sales have grown 172 percent since then, <laughs> driven by <laughs> driven by live rosin and live resin. Wow, oh. they're moving away from distillate because of the freshness of the plant and stuff like that. They're getting it better. And plus, I remember I told you I smoked my first porcelain. We did. We smoked mm-hmm. our first porcelain uh, cartridge. Wow, what a difference. Right. So, I so think, those are chemical free. There's no additives well, no, in the process of. No, uh, the porcelain coil instead no. of. Oh, what are I you? know, but the cartridge, when you're having a live resin or rosin, it's, it's well, chemical free. It's the live ro- rosin is solventless. Resin, they use CO2 extract. Uh. So, But with the rosin, though, it's, it's, it's straight up pressed. I mean, it's straight up just deliciousness. It's solventless. So that's why people are moving more towards that. It's so nice and clean. I mean, we're smoking that right now. Right. Solventless uh, hash right now. And it's fucking phenomenal. So, I mean, people are going there and they're finding out that uh, basically... 
not really many people are getting sick from it, you know, from the vape cartridges, the, the weed vape cartridges, you know, and it's just, it's growing. It's convenient. It's easy. It's nice. Well, um, with vapes, it, a lot of the concern is the chemicals and the additives and the carriers of the nicotine. Like I'm talking about like a regular nicotine vape, right. that, ever, that was supposed to be the, the gateway to get out of smoking cigarettes was right. to go over to vape and do these jewels. And it was inconspicuous. It didn't smell, right. it didn't taste bad, but most people tend to, I think, smoke what I have witnessed people Me. who smoked and <laughs> and other people friends and stuff that have switched over to vapes smoke a shit ton more because oh, so they easy. don't have to go outside no, so the smell doesn't bother anybody right. so they sit on that and puff and puff and puff or right, sorry i'm going on a little tangent here but it was it it in that instance it's all of the extra shit that's in there it's not just the nicotine it's the chemicals that carry and make the vape work that were the concern of popcorn lungs. And we don't know long-term effects because right. they're newer products, blah, blah, blah. So if you're smoking, like you were just saying it. So for people who may not have tried cartridges, um, this is a cartridge that doesn't have all those additives. It's just straight. They press the leaves of the plant until like Buds. the rosin or the resin comes out and one method requires CO two. You said to extract, and uh, the other, yeah, it's and just the other press. doesn't. It's right. just pr it's just squeezing all of the juices all out of the, the plant. Oh goodness! <laughs> so, I guess my point is, or my question is, that if you are smoking a pure rosin or resin that's solventless, all those other things that were said or thought to create problems when you vape aren't there right no. like the process of vaping isn't much different than smoking right no well it's healthier because it's not burning right right it's, yeah it's you're a vape. just heating you're not, you're not having smoke in your lungs so you're just having pure vapor just vape of yeah. the actual pure concentrate right. so really really clean mm -hmm. product yeah huh interesting but I, my cheeks turned red. My that was a that was a big. Uh, but I don't just know. put it this way: legal weed retailers have sold more than two point eight billion worth of vape cards so far this year. So a lot of people are two point eight billion. Oh, is a lot. It's kind of like edibles, though, in the sense that yeah, you you I, don't have to think about it. like someone who's never consumed weed is a lot of people who are new to it aren't going to go buy loose flour and papers. Right. And they're not probably not going to buy a bowl. That won't be their first right. thing. Right. They might buy a pre-roll. Yeah. Or they're going to buy a cartridge or but they're they, going to buy they edibles. Like the cartridge. I would say that's your maybe, first. Maybe maybe because they, they live in a place where you can't smell weed smoke. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you travel a lot. It's just easy. It's you easy. Don't, there's no no thinking. I mean, smoking a vape in a hotel room instead of having to go outside every five minutes. We're going to go back to that. I don't give a fuck. Uh Smoking a vape in a hotel room and have to go outside if you don't have a balcony and you have to go down to the parking lot to smoke, fuck that. I ain't, I'm taking an edible and hitting my vape, car, vape right. when it's 20 below outside. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's convenient. It's nice. You could travel with it. You could smoke in hotels, your car, whatever. That's why people like it. It's convenient. So clean weed. What's the buzz that cannabis users and growers, I mean... This, we've talked about clean weed on mm -hmm, this show. Mm -hmm. We've talked about chemicals being put in weed. So yep. what's the buzz? Well, clean weed is creating an organic buzz among cannabis users and growers. While organic fruits and vegetables are common at the grocery store, a clean cannabis movement is sprouting up as more and more cannabis users look for healthy alternatives. 40-year-old Manny Alvarez is what you'd call a boss which is why every morning you'll find him checking on his star employees, all 400 bajillion of them. I find it fascinating, he said, looking at the bin full of composted dirt. There are more microbes in a teaspoon of soil than there are stars in our galaxy. Alvarez and his partner, Terry Sardinas, are growing are part of a growing number of California cannabis farmers who only produce regenerative weed or clean weed. Regenerative agriculture essentially is just using nature to grow plants, he said. Instead of chemicals and pesticides, Alvarez uses insects and worms found right in his Bird Valley Organics farm in Santa Cruz. 
It all started when Alvarez, a third-generation farmer, stumbled on a book about regenerative agriculture. Soon, he was making his own compost and planting cover crops, known to increase fertility. Eight years later, his cannabis plants are not only healthier, but more potent than ever. We'll have other minor can cannabinoids that are prevalent that are just not your THC or CBD, which everyone knows, he said. We'll pull off cannabinoids like CBG, CBN, CBDA, and in high amounts. His clean weed has attracted more than just insects. On a sunny October morning, Alvarez was showing his new hybrid cannabis flower to Ryan Courtney, a product director for cannabis wellness company Rose Mary Jane. Courtney said that in the last couple of years, regenerative weed has become one of the most in-demand items at his dispensaries. A lot of our customers are patients, he said, so they cannot afford to have chemicals or any other additives, and the last thing that we want to do is add anything unnecessary to their product and to their experience. While the regenerative movement is still in its infancy, Alvarez hopes it gains traction in the near future, as more and more people look for healthier options. If you care about your body and you happen to smoke cannabis, you should probably care about the cannabis you're smoking too, he said. So, interesting. So, what's the difference between, like, we've had organic weed or sun-grown, like, pesticide and... I wonder how different that would be from this regenerative. I don't know. I don't know. It's interesting. It's I have to more, read more about yeah. that. I'm interested in yeah. knowing I'm more about it. I'm interested to keep on following it if anybody knows them. and We'd love to have them on the show. That's why I gave you the article because mm -hmm. I knew it was very, very interesting. And compared to all the different weed, types of weed we've smoked, I mean, I'm sure we've smoked pesticide weed before. So, I mean, I, I mean, who knows? But I'm still here. <laughs> hey. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, uh, the big news of the day. Okay, this is uh, eleven sixteen. My dad's birthday. Rest in rest in peace, Poppy. I love you. He had been seventy two, seventy four today, right? Seventy two. He had been seventy two today. Yeah. Yeah. Eleven sixteen, nineteen fifty. Hmm. Yeah, he would have been fucking seventy two. Anyway, but on this day, on eleven sixteen. The governor of Kentucky signs executive orders allowing medical cannabis possession from other states and regulating Delta 8 THC. This is big. I mean, he did an executive order that they, people can use cannabis in that state medically and they can bring it into their state up to eight ounces <laughs> and not get arrested for it. I'm sure there's going to be some pushback. But the executive order relies on, on the governor's unilateral authority to issue clemency within the state and grants full, complete, conditional pardons to any and all persons who meet certain criteria. But here's what you also need to do, Governor. That's great that you just did this, but you also need to – everybody who's in jail for what you're now allowing needs to be – as long as it's nonviolent, they need to be allowed out. So – um, each person must also have a certification from a licensed healthcare provider. It shows the individual has been diagnosed with at least one of the 21 medical conditions, which include cancer, multiple sclerosis. You can read all about this. You must keep a copy of your certification. Uh, because the governor cannot himself change criminal statutes or direct police not to enforce certain laws, it means that patients could still potentially face law enforcement action for possessing medical cannabis, even if purchased legally in another state. But it does mean that they will be considered pardoned for the offense. John, the other one was about Delta 8 and uh, can be synthesized from federally legal hemp-derived CBD. So that's good. So um, I think it's amazing. There's some, a lot of people supporting it. And I think everybody in the state of Kentucky, they've been growing weed up in those mountains for fucking ever. I've smoked some good Kentucky fucking weed. We've talked about it before. So, I mean, but Governor, man, good job on what you did. I know there's going to be a lot of logistics now going through this, but you did it for the people. Now you got to get people to believe in it. So here's something even crazier. Nearly half of Americans now reside in states where cannabis is legal. 155 million Americans now live in a state where weed is legal. Hmm. Fucking awesome. Uh, Jesse Ventura, if you don't know him, Jesse the Body Ventura, former wrestler, actor, governor of Minnesota, 
and much more activist and conspiracy theorist, and the list goes on and on. But he tells it like it is. I like Jesse the Body Ventura. <laughs> I think he's fucking <laughs> awesome. I've been following his career since I was a kid watching him wrestling. So when he used to call, he used to call Hulk Hogan Chump Hogan. I thought it was the greatest thing ever because everybody loved Hulk Hogan. He called him <laughs> Chump. <laughs> <laughs> so good. But anyway, so Jesse Ventura says the governor Walsh told him cannabis legalization will be among first laws passed. That's dope. Good for him. Uh, Colorado, the state I was just in, has sold $13 billion of cannabis since legalization in 2012. $13 billion. That's a, 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 almost a billion dollars. That's over a billion dollars a year since 2012. Pretty good. Good job, Colorado. All right. I, I think I, I know you know what this is, but I really don't know if you've ever smoked out of one. I don't know if I have either. So... What the hell is a chillum for all you out there that doesn't know what chillum? Yeah. The true stoners of the world have been smoking out of chillums forever because they just keep them right in their pocket, stuffed with weed, with their lighter, and they just pull them out as needed throughout the day. You could feel, you could probably get four or five hits out of a chillum if you're doing it by yourself. So a one hitter, but they're it's not the different. same. No, they're one different. hitter is a one this, hit. Right, one hit, slap out, done. This can pack like a mm. bowl, but it's a. So go ahead, I'll let you talk. I'll let you sit, but I'll let you talk about it. But I know why why the stoners of the world love a good chillum. Okay. Well, everything you need to know about these pot smoking devices, including their history, how they differ from one hitters, and so much more. That's what we have in this article. After consuming herb, weed, pot, flour, THC, or whatever else you want to call it in the literal centuries, that we've figured out a hell of a lot. Wow, I'm not reading right. <laughs> <laughs> Like I'm not understanding punctuation right now. <laughs> Big girl. What up, yo? Help. <laughs> My brain is melting. All right, I'm going to start that over again. Do you want me to? I forgot, nope. I forgot an article. Do you want me it. to go back? No, I got Reverse it. Reverse it? No, nope. I got it. All right. After consuming herb, weed, pot, flour, THC, or whatever else you want to call it for literal centuries, we've figured out a hell of a lot of means of managing that consumption. And while most folks are familiar with the basics, bongs, pipes, and joints, to name a few, there are also a number of devices that are a little less commonly known. Chillums, for instance, are one such device. For the uninitiated, a chillum is a small hollow tube with a bowl on one end, I can picture it in my brain, and a a mouthpiece on the other. Unlike their friends' pipes and bowls, chillums lack a carb, which is a hole uh, in the pipe or bowl that controls airflow. That's the simple explanation, but there's a lot more to it. And you can learn all about them, their history, and more in this article. So, Chillum versus One Hitter. You might be wondering, isn't a Chillum just another name for a One Hitter? Well, the answer is yes, but also no. While they serve a similar purpose, there are some subtle differences. Chillums, for instance, are usually cone shaped and tend to have a larger bowl diameter that tapers to the mouthpiece, which is typically designed to accommodate usage in a water pipe. By contrast, one hitters are often slimmer and more uniform tubes, often made to look like cigarettes and take about the same amount of room. Furthermore, one hitters are often sold with a dugout, a rectangular case, roughly the same size and shape as a, as a cigarette pack, that has compartments to store both the one hitter and a stash of herb. And last but not least, while one hitters are usually tiny for easy stashing, some chillums can sometimes be quite long and large and not as pocketable. So how do you smoke a chillum? The traditional way to smoke a chillum, which is most often associated with smoking charas, a kind of cannabis resin, is a little odd when compared to other pipes and might remind you more of large bongs than, say, one-hitters. If you want to make the most of it, you'll need a friend, as this does require more than two hands. First, you'll want to pack the bowl tightly, but with enough room for decent airflow. Then, with the chillum held vertically, you'll take one hand and slide the mouthpiece between your pinky and ring finger, and then with the other hand, cup around that first hand, creating kind of an airtight cave or cavern, like you might want to warm your hands in the freezing cold, right? Uh, if you've done this correctly, the chillum should look like a chimney sticking straight up from your cupped hands. 
Then you'll have your friend light the herb, resin, or whatever else you're smoking, and you'll pull through the chillum into your hands, and then so your hands create like a cooling chamber, Mm -hmm. right? And then finally into your lungs. Of course, there's also a slightly more advanced one-person method as well. For all intent and purposes, this method is very similar to the two-person method. However, rather than using both hands to create an airtight chamber, you'll use one, squeezing that hand into a tiny cavern, albeit a slightly smaller one than you would have with two hands, and then using your free hand to light the chillum. For smaller chillums, one's more similar in size to one hitters, you can also simply light the bowl and smoke it like you might smoke out of any other pipe. Just be aware that this method could result in having you deal with a bit of ash or embers on your lips or in your mouth. Furthermore, because chillums, like one hitters, don't come with a carb, you'll want to be careful not to pack it too tight so air can actually flow through it. And then the history of a chillum. Ancient chillums have been spotted in India, Nepal, South America, Jamaica, Asia, and the Middle East and South Africa, among other places. <clears throat> the first chillums were made from clay, stone, animal horns, or wood. Now chillums are typically made of glass, aluminum, or stainless steel. It's also not clear why the chillum came to the United States. Some say it's American visitors bringing them back as souvenirs. Some say it's the hippie movement. But it's generally agreed <clears throat> that they came to the U.S. in the 1960s. And what exactly is a chillum good for? As is the case with just about any gear category, it helps to know what specific instances these weed smoking devices are good for. If you're looking for something discreet and portable, look no further than a chillum. They don't need a lot of prep. All you need is a chillum, a lighter, and some bud. They fit in your pocket, and they can you can find some that look like cigarettes if you really want to be sneaky or just look like a cool person who enjoys a little ciggy from time to time. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah. So many people I know that use chillums. You don't even. They pull it out so quick. They're so quick with it because you just. They just. You don't even see that it's in their hand like this. I've seen they, that. Yeah. yeah. And it's they cover it like you said, like you like it's you were just in talking their hand. about. Yeah. It's so quick and it's in their pocket. Mm-hmm. I mean, and because they they've been doing it for so long, and and you don't even see it happen. It's so quick, and I know so many guys and gals and folks and people out there that love using a chillum for that reason because it's so quick. You put it right back in your pocket, lighter, and they keep, that bowl is packed for their whole for their whole maybe work day, you know. And hmm. it is like they pack it enough to where they get their four hits for their work day and they're good. And then they go back out to the car and they, if they need it, they repack it again. Hmm. So it was just a quick work thing, you know, like a cigarette break. You're taking a chillum break. So you know. they just exhaust it and put it back in their pocket yep. with the weed yeah. in the bowl. Yeah, the weed stays in the bowl, so they're done smoking it. They huh. don't. They take one quick hit. They don't. How does the to, weed not fall out of because there? Because it's it's packed in there just enough, and they hmm. keep it up. Upright. Right. Yeah, and like you know where you have that like you have that lighter pocket. I've seen people use them. That's where I I I, I know people keep theirs. Uh. Yeah, and there the whole time it stays straight up, and it's you can't even see it, and they just pop it out when they need it throughout the day. Fucking brilliant, brilliant. Hmm. Neat. Chillin pipes are perfect for a solo sesh thanks to the bowl size. And if you're new to ingesting cannabis, chillums are a great starting point. All you have to do is load it, light it, and slowly inhale. They're also perfect for microdosing. So what's not great about them? Well, just as there are good occasions and arenas for these THC-consuming devices, there are also things you want to be wary of. Chillum pipes can be a bit harsher on your lungs and throat thanks to the lack of a carb. The smoke goes directly from the bowl to the mouthpiece. And depending on the chillum's design and how strongly you inhale, you might be at risk of inhaling ash, embers, or a rogue piece of unlit cannabis. Mesh screens prevent this, and some chillums have built-in mouthpieces to solve this problem. You can use your chillum in a group setting, but it going to require a lot of repacking. Not to say you can't use a chillum with the homies, but it might be worth using a bong instead if you're seshing with a crew. Chillums can get very hot despite the cooling capabilities of the pipe. Be careful if you're new to using one. You can easily burn your lips or mouth if you're not careful. Like anything, practice makes perfect. I I know, like I said, a, a lot of people that use a chillum, and I've always said that chillum is like a personal thing. I never see many people sharing their chillums because it's just there for their day and I know people have offered me their chillum and I've always refused it not because I didn't want to smoke it because I feel it's a more personal it's a personal it's a personal device. thing yes it's it's like 
It's like someone asked me for a hit of my, my when I used to vape or a hit of my cigarette yep. when I used to smoke cigs. If someone came up to me and asked me, hey, can I get a hit of that? I'd be like, no, dude. No. Fuck no. <laughs> you ain't touching my cig. Here, I'll give you one. Take up my cig. I don't want a whole one. Dude, you're not touching my cig. I think the only person I ever shared a cig was with you. Yeah. Yeah, I think in my whole entire life. I think sharing cigarettes is gross. <laughs> so I, 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 it's a it's a thing with, with the chillum to me. It's a personal thing. I wouldn't ask to smoke someone's cigarette out of their mouth. Bull, bong, what all that kind of stuff. Vape, vape. I mean, I share vape cartridges all the time with people. So I mean, different story. But a chillum to me is a personal item. Right. You know, you don't ask to take a rip off of someone's chillum, even if they offer. I think that's just their chillum. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I, I follow. Yeah. International news. Bill to be introduced that would legalize personal use of cannabis. Uh, a bill that would legalize the personal use of cannabis is set to go before the Dolly in around two weeks. The bill was due to be introduced during the summer, but was delayed. Um, the people before profit said the Dublin Midwest TD told the journal it is a relatively short bill and will amend the current legalization of possession in cannabis, which is the Misuse of Drugs Act. The amendment doesn't reference the cultivation of cannabis, and it's anticipated the bill is approved by the Dolly. Uh, which means it requires the approval of the government parties and changes regarding cultivation of cannabis could be added at uh, committee stage. The bill would end the uh, uh, criminalization of cannabis for personal use. Said Kenny, people before profit is for complete regulation, but this is the stepping stone to that. The bill will make it legal for someone to possess up to seven grams of cannabis. Uh, he said is on par with the legalization in Malta and Luxembourg. Sweet. Uh, let's go through, man. I want a celebration here. Uh, the Green Party leader, Edmund Ryan, told the journal IE four years ago that he thought uh, such coffee shops would work here. The Green Party previously called the introduction of Dutch-style coffee shops to Ireland that will allow the consumption and sale of cannabis uh, for 18 years and older under certain conditions. So we'll see what happens. Go Ireland. Uh, this is something, another thing happened in Ireland. About 100 bags of cannabis waste dumped in an Irish town. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it was an illegal grow. But 100 pounds of waste, so that's probably just like dried up leaves and stems and yeah. that's it whatever else they were doing with it so uh this little small irish community uh will be left footing the bill someone dumped more than 100 bags of waste from illegal cannabis grow under the cloak of darkness uh earlier this month uh the following monday's workers from louth county council came in to collect the trash and clear the area the cost is which is uh expected to be borne by the taxpayers so someone made the money illegally right traditional market as we call it and because you don't have legal cannabis, so this is what people are doing. So instead of letting these people grow, don't tax it. Let people just grow it. Make it legal. Caregivers. Do the caregiver program because it works. Let people grow for people and just and then have waste companies come and pick the waste so people make money. And then you tax the waste companies on that because they're making a shitload of money. And it, and that goes back to the community. It's problem solved. Uh, talk to Mr. or Mrs. Weedman. We'll help you out. <laughs> <laughs> now, this story... Uh, kind of boils my blood, <laughs> to be exact. <laughs> and here's why. Remember, Mr. Weedman's been talking about all the cannabis that's been being wasted, thrown out, yes. burned, destroyed. Yes. And we have people having to give their blood away to be able to afford medical cannabis in this country. Crazy. Mrs. Weedman, it's will wrong. you tell me the story, please? Yep. Before my blood boils even more. Daryl... Pelsray noticed his tremors getting worse for a decade before he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. The shaking got so bad for Pelsray, who is now 43, that workers followed him through grocery stores and police stopped him eight times asking whether he was under the influence of drugs. He found it easier to just stay home. Prescription drugs didn't seem to help, made him feel sick, lowered his appetite, so Pulse Ray decided to try medical cannabis, which became legal in his home state of Ohio in 2016. It slowed me down completely, said Pulse Ray. For the first time in three years, I was able to carry a drink up my stairs to the bedroom. But Pulse Ray can't afford medical cannabis and said that he has sold blood plasma to pay for what he needs. Pels Ray said it costs him about $600 per month for edibles, tincture, and up to 28 grams of smokable flour. While Medicaid covers his opioids and other prescription pain meds, it won't pay for cannabis, which is still illegal, as we know, in the eyes of the federal government. But polls show most people supporting legalizing cannabis for medical use, and 38 states have medical programs. 
In October, the Biden administration announced a review of all cannabis research to decide whether federal law should be changed. At the same time, Congress is considering new laws that would allow more research and no longer make it a federal crime to have cannabis. But it isn't clear if Democrats, who don't all support legalization, will be able to pass any new laws on weed before the end of the year. Those decisions could impact Pelsray and more than 5 million medical cannabis cardholders across the country using the drug to treat everything from severe seizure disorders to chronic pain and post Uh, traumatic stress disorder. Politico, who uh, produced this um, article, is launching a nationwide project exploring how easy or difficult it is for people to access cannabis for medical treatment. The information gathered with this survey will be used in a project funded by the USC Annenberg Center for Health Journalism and their 2022 National Fellowship. If you or someone else who uses Uh, medical cannabis who's close to you um, are interested, it is kind of, I think that it's pretty critical to do this. So if you are a medical patient and or have someone close to you who is, especially if they're having issues uh, affording or acquiring the medical cannabis, uh, definitely go to politico.com and look for this project and you can fill out a survey. It looked like it maybe took 10 minutes or so and um, you can share your experiences and they're going to collect the data and do some research and hopefully it can help them address the issue um, so that that can change. I mean, I was fucking upset when I read that article. Mm -hmm. I mean, are you kidding me? Come on, man. Guy's got to give blood so he could buy some cannabis. Right. We we throw out millions of pounds a year. Yeah, like if there was kind of like an um, like a hardship program through the medical dispensaries where people like maybe you have to supply like if you were going to go on public aid, you have to su- supply support. You know, you have to give them documentation that shows your income and what you can and can't afford, and maybe a little bit more involved in what your diagnosis is yeah. and why you need this medical yeah, cannabis. Should be. And then maybe there could be some sort of a discount program that happens. Discount. Through. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like you, you know, you pay five bucks for an hour, something just so it registers you, through their system, a dollar, whatever, right? A dollar. And just let people you, have the medication. You do have to charge. Right. Everybody has to be charged something. So a penny or a dollar. You just right. go and you show proof that here's your med card you get 2.5 ounces but of, you have to qualify for this hardship cannabis program. a month hardship program you you get to buy your 2.5 ounces for 20 dollars. right and then they won't have to throw all this weed away right because i'm sure there's a shit ton of oh, people 100%. that would qualify <clears throat> for the program so <laughs> fucking crazy um when i was growing up back in florida there was a thing that people would go we had an infestation in florida of these toads that came up from south america and they were poisonous toads and when you saw it was on the golf course you go to the golf course at night they'd all be out at night and when they and no one knew what was going on a lot of dogs in the neighborhood were dying or getting violently ill Hmm. these frogs secreted this white looking pus this from all the back, sounds awful from their back of their eyelids okay to go to find out that the dogs were licking these toads and were making them violently ill or killing them because it would, it would put them in a form of, it was poison basically it was they secret poison out so, mm-hmm. so they couldn't get eaten and uh we used to go hit them with with golf clubs on the golf course to oh, kill them. <laughs> boys dirty yeah, we, boys we, we, anyway we doing, were bad kids but they were killing the dogs in the neighborhood so we felt we were doing our due, our due diligence <laughs> you were so helping we were helping <laughs> uh but anyway people used to go on the golf courses though in our high school and lick these fucking frogs and get <gasps> stoned Why? out of their mind and see and trip balls that's crazy they used to call a frog looking hey you want to go frog fuck no i ain't licking no fucking frog Ugh. that's fucking gross Gross, 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 gross. But they were doing... This is like the 90s. Here it is again. 2022. And the, the national... The frogs are back. The fucking feds tell the national park visitors to stop licking psychedelic toads. 
<laughs> That's kind of gross. It just... It's just the trippy, they're calling it the trippy toad licking. We called it frog licking. We didn't know there were toads back then, but they found out later there were toads. But it, it's a, it's enough that the agency is warning people. <laughs> <laughs> it's a terrible practice to Don't say. lick a frog. <laughs> Don't do Remember it. when we were growing up as kids and parents would tell us, parents would tell us if you touch a frog, you get warts. Mm -hmm. This is not true. It's a lie. But if you lick this frog, you're gonna. But it's feel just fucking. Out. I mean, yes, you're gonna be fucking tripping balls. It's like it's like almost as strong as DMT or a DMT derivative. Yeah. It, I, it's not even worth it. And it's like I said, the same toads that that the fucking poison came from behind the eyes. So it could be fatal if ingested. And I think one person in our in our in our where I live, grew up as a kid, someone did die from it. And I think that's when it like went crazy and they started massively killing these toads on the golf course and all over to try to get rid of them because people were fucking nuts and they were fucking psychedelically out on fucking toad poison <laughs> 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 and then doing it again. Why don't we learn from our mistakes? I don't get it. It's so fucking funny. Frog looking 2.0. <laughs> 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 Listen, whatever floats your boat. If you want to lick a frog, lick a frog. I'm not here to fucking judge, but I think it's gross. And when I was a kid, my mom told me if you touched a frog, you got warts. Ew. <laughs> she must have been really concerned that you might lick a frog. The worst part about it That's is, why she told but you. But the that. worst part about no, it No, that was more like if you just touched a frog. The worst part about it is I had warts on my knee as a kid. They got removed on my knee, and my mom said, oh, did you touch a frog? <laughs> <laughs> I had them burned off as a kid. I mean, I did have, I mean, they were a common thing. So, uh, I, but the point is, I didn't touch a frog, but whether or not you decide to lick a frog or not, that's on you and your choice. Just be careful doing it. Start low and go slow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you really have to do it, yeah, <laughs> do it wisely. <laughs> oh, shit. Frog licking, toad licking, skippy mm, toes. Would you do it for a dollar? Oh, for a dollar? If someone I said, wouldn't even do it for a hundred dollars. Would you do it for a million? Mm. Would you lick a toad for a million? Blech. For a million dollars, Blech. tax free. So you're know. walking with a mill. I'd do it. I'd be like, give me that motherfucking. Yeah. <laughs> I know you'd do it. You did some. I ate a goldfish yeah. for a hundred bucks. A live goldfish. I, I fucking just right down the hatch. I didn't even taste it. I just opened That's my. disgusting. <laughs> hundred dollars, man. Times were tough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was 2008. <laughs> <laughs> 2008. <laughs> the... Right. The housing exactly. bubble. Exactly. 2008. I earned us a hundred bucks. I was bartending and we needed money. Hey, got to do what you got to do. I ate a goldfish for a hundo. <laughs> Frog licking for a mill? I do it for a mill. I lick two toads for a mill. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let, let's not push it. <laughs> oh shit! You got anything else to say? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, make sure you wash your mouth out <laughs> with, with, to with toad? after you after you lick the toad. <laughs> mm -hmm. Million dollars. We get rid of those warts on the tongue. <laughs> Ugh. <laughs> you got nothing else? No. Hey, everybody out there in the world, we love you. Be kind to one another. This world needs it. Man, 8 billion people on this planet as of yesterday. Chew. There's a lot of us. We all need to love one another. Take care of this planet because it'll take care of us. Everybody out there in the world, we love you. Smoke some big fat doinks. Thank you, Got Get Doinks, for the gifts. I'm going to wear that shirt. I can't wait. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody out there in the world for listening. As Paulie always says, smoke smart. Puff, puff, and away. Puff, puff, pass.